All right. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to episode four of Photo Talk Plus. Uh, I'm Thomas Hawk, and I'm here with my co-host Lotus Carroll. Hello. And we've got a very special show tonight. We've got uh, Trey Ratcliffe uh, of Stuck in Custom Spain and Google Plus Fame and all kinds of other fame. <laughs> special guest tonight, so we're going to be talking to Trey, and we've got some wonderful panelists, um, so I'm excited about that as well. So, um, hey Lotus, do you want to introduce our uh, panelists tonight? Yes. We have Brian Matias. What's going Brian, on, guys? Tell everybody where th uh, they can find you on the web and anything you want them to know about yourself. Sure. Um, well, I'm uh, the education manager at Online Software, and I'm a photographer. Uh, so it's kind of cool getting to teach people how to use the software while getting paid to actually go out and shoot for uh, the materials there. Um, and then if you uh, if you want to get to follow me on, on Google+, Plus, that's kind of where I've gotten to know everyone here, and I've known Trey for a, a bit longer. Uh, it's just, uh, I think my new URL is uh, plusbrian.com, which forwards to my uh, profile. Sweet. Yeah. We also have from Google, Chris Chabot. Hey Lotus, how are you doing? So I'm Chris Chabot, I manage the developer relations team for Google+, Plus. so we work with external companies to get them Google+, Plus enabled. And next to that, I'm also a bit of a photography fan, so that's what I do most of my spare time. I just love how it balances out the left brain and right brain activities in my time. So that's the very short version of me. And, of okay. course, you can find me on Google+. Plus. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we also have Liliana. Hi, Lotus. Hi. Hi. Hi, hi everyone. What? Why? No, hi. <laughs> no, hi. I said hi. <laughs> Hello? Okay. Can you hear me, Oh, yeah. We can hear you. Oh, okay. So, um, hi, everyone. Um, well, this is my first hangout, so I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> but, um, uh, well, my name is Liliana. I'm very honored, actually, first of all, to be part of this panel and to be part of this hangout. And, um, well, I'm, well, right now I'm basically uh, I'm studying a, a marketing master's, and I consider myself a photographer learner. I, I think, cause, you know, I'm, I think there's so much to learn. And um, I basically shoot uh, macro uh, flowers, flora. That's what you basically see on my Google Plus um, uh, page. And um, well, you can find me on Google Plus. It's just Lily Space Anna. That's it. And that's the main place where we can find your photography. Um, yes. Yeah. 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 So far, yeah. I mostly interact over there now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. We also have helping us broadcast right now and recording for us, Keith Barrett. Hi, uh, I'm Keith Barrett. Uh, you can find me on Google Plus as well, and you can also find me on the VidcastNetwork.com, uh, live streaming hangouts and uh, anything else that uh, people would like to do. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for helping out, Keith. And, of course, as Thomas said, we have our special guest, Trey Ratcliffe. Hello. How are you, Lotus and Thomas and everybody? Good. So, uh, Trey, uh, people probably will have a hard time finding you on the web, won't they? <laughs> yeah. I'm hidden away in a dark corner of a basement. I'm like that notice at the beginning of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that Arthur Dent had to find. <laughs> well, you're, very, uh, you're very secretive on the web. Nobody, you're very elusive. <laughs> About as elusive as you. <laughs> yeah, probably. A, yes, huh? Well, uh, of course, people can find Trey on Google Plus, where he's uh, quite well regarded, as well as uh, StuckInCustoms.com, uh, which is that's your main site, right, Trey? Yeah, that's sort of the mothership, the Queen Mary of my digital life. Oh, okay, or the Queen yeah. Bee. And uh, you use Twitter sometimes too, right? I do, although I, I spend most of my uh, time now in Google+. Plus. Uh, I think all my, all my Twitter updates just point back to uh, Google+. Plus. 
Oh, so you're one of those types, are you? <laughs> yeah. Kind of like me. <laughs> Love it. Kind of like me. Then. Well, that's great. Well, uh, thanks to everyone for being on the show tonight. It should be a fun show. Um, we've got a couple of different stories that we're going to talk about tonight before we get into the interview with Trey. Um, the first story we're going to talk about is, I don't know if you guys saw that uh, Paul Allen... Uh, not the Microsoft Paul Allen, but the Ancestry.com Paul Allen, uh, an unofficial Google Plus statistician, uh, came out with a story this week that says Google Plus passes 62 million users. And, of course, Chris Chabot will happily confirm that number <laughs> on tonight's broadcast. Do a little dance, Chris. Not, not really. But... Uh, I think I think only uh, uh, only uh, Mr. Gundotra himself is allowed to let that one out of the bag. But uh, also, you know, according to Paul, Google Plus is adding about 625,000 new users per day, and Paul predicted uh, 400 million users by the end of 2012. I know that's a big prediction, isn't it? That's huge. That's and what is what is what does Twitter have now? Like 200 million or something? <laughs> It's yeah, I haven't followed their latest numbers, but that's about the region that they're in, right? That's true. Yeah. So, so what, what do you, Chris? What do, what do you think about this? First of all, you can't really talk officially, I'm sure, about this, but uh, yeah. Uh, usually, we give Larry the stage to announce the newest numbers. The last couple times he did an uh, earnings call, so I think he'd be personally upset with me if I gave away too much. So <laughs> I'm not gonna go there. You probably wouldn't get yeah. to use the company jet anymore, would you? I know. That would be <laughs> such a bummer. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, we're all seeing it. The numbers are growing quite rapidly. We're incredibly pleased with that. And it's growing faster than we even expected. So we're super happy with that. Uh, in the past, I have to say that all statistics have been somewhat accurate. He has this whole scheme going on where he looks at the last names of the people who are on Google+. Plus and has this big calculation to do a guesstimate for how many people there are. So while I bet that the number isn't 100% accurate, he's usually in the right ballpark. Oh, ah, okay. Which is kind of exciting. It, well, it certainly feels to me, I know in December, uh, it certainly feels like you know, like things have been exploding. I don't know. I know, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, new users and a big surge of people in mm -hmm. December. Yeah, I, I think too. Paul's definitely right on one thing, and that's 2012 is going to be the breakout year. We've got so many cool new features com coming out. Even Q1 2012 is going to be quite epic in that regard. We've got some really nice surprises around the corner. Plus, one of our big goals is to make everything better thanks to Google+, Plus, right? So we're going to make Android that much better because of it. And if you look at the new I'm Scream sandwich phone, you'll see some of the first steps there where contacts are becoming better of it. You can follow people right on your phone. You can upload images instantly. We're making search better, YouTube, uh, all these other cool things that we have going on at Google. So I imagine that as those things get implemented, there's we haven't seen the beginning of this yet. It, it's going to be a very exciting year. That's great. Trey, you're using the new Nexus phone now, right? Yeah, I love my new Galaxy Nexus. It, it completes me. <laughs> and like... Um, <laughs> like Chris was saying, uh, this is just the beginning. I don't think just in terms of features that we all know and love, how, how quick Google iterates, but I think it's just the beginning for all of us. And I know, you know, to me, Google Plus is about people that I, I follow, right? I love getting inspired by more and more people that come into the network, and we get this network effect. But, you know, for those of you that are watching that are interested in getting followers, Right, that should never really be your uh, your modus operandi. But I know many people are concerned about it. And the exciting thing about all these people coming on is that we're all now, uh, even if you're just watching, don't be mistaken. You're all in the top five percent of the world when it comes to followers. You might, you know, don't compare yourself to people like Thomas Hawk and I. We're sort of anomalies or whatever. But really. Think about the six billion people on Earth, and you know we're all so excited now. It's sixty million people on on Google Plus. That's nothing. You know that's one one hundredth of the world's population, and everything is trending in this direction. So soon there will be billions and billions. I want to say soon. I mean not too many years, but you know don't get flummoxed about followers and all this nonsense. Don't worry about that because you are in the top five percent. And just look back in a few years, look back on this night and remember that I 
mm-hmm. Trey said this thing, but you are. You are really on the cutting edge of this stuff. It's not a mature industry. It's just beginning. Like Chris said, it is, it is absolutely the beginning in every sense of the word. Well, and keep in mind as well that Google, there's well over a billion people who use Google every day. So as we keep adding features, more and more of those people will start using Google Plus as well. That's exciting. And another point that Trey has made in the past is this really is just the beginning of the evolution. Most of the world isn't connected on the Internet yet, but when they do get connected, magic starts happening, right? So as that is spreading around, big stuff is going to happen. Totally what do you guys think this means for the photography community? I mean, the photographers are already quite active on Google+. Plus. I mean, it's, they've been one of the, I think, the standout communities on Google+. Plus. How, is, this, is more and more people, is this going to change the photography community on Google+, Plus? is it going to make it better, is it going to, what do you think? I think you're going to add, I mean, there's going to be more and more people, there's going to be more people that you're interested in following, so people will probably have to hone in on, you know, exactly who they want to follow more. I think you do have to make choices, too, when there's more users, there's more people to follow, but mm-hmm. there's also people who are going to be more into what you're into, so specific types of photography, you know, a lot more uh, of the quality photographers who haven't come to Google Plus yet, or I think are going to migrate here. So, I think it serves a, a definitely a, a unique uh, place, you know, with, with the whole big universe of social media. You've got it, it, it's almost inevitable to compare it to something like Facebook. And the good thing about this is that Facebook has already filled a, a, a need for people to, you know, rant and talk about, you know, the last time they blew their nose, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and you see the qual- and I'm talking also from a <clears throat> interacting with the user's perspective, you know, again, coming back to a corporate setting of, of uh, being a face for on one. I, I, I monitor all of our social media, and so I compare our on one page versus, say, our, our Facebook page for on one versus the one on Google+, Plus, which has been a, a fantastic thing when, since uh, Google opened up pages. Um, and just the, the, the quality, and I'm not talking about, you know, good versus bad, but I'm talking about just the, 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 the interest in feedback that's left by people. You know, people, are, I think, are here um, truly because it is a place for inspiration, as Trey was saying, and learning. So, so I, I think it's, it's um, Facebook, you know, definitely paved the way, but Google is, is kind of serving a need for, for beyond what Facebook, I think, offers in terms of a social media network. And I think photography, because it is primarily a visual medium, um, and I was just talking about this with my sister, you know, it's just, people always want to shoot, people always want to get better, and, um, and uh, you know, the fact that Google allows us to, uh, with these utilities here, with the ability to share big uh, images, large images, um, and, and the ability to comment thoughtfully, uh, I think that is why you see such a, a flourish of photographers. Uh, and another thing that I think is incredibly exciting is, uh, I, I think a bunch of you have already met people like Karen Hutton and Barry Blanchett and other folks who we hang out with in real life in photo walks and stuff. In the beginning of Google+, Plus, they maybe occasionally took a picture, but over time they became photographers. If you look at some of Karen's work now, it just blows me away. It's incredible how good she became. And the same for Barry. He's, he started out with taking an occasional picture, and now he's doing wildlife and nature photography that is just dr- jaw-dropping. So it's just a bunch of people coming together and learning together. I think... If there's one staple of Google+, Plus, is that it's people communicating and learning together and talking together. And that makes so much magic happen, right? And that's really exciting to me. I think one of the things that's nice with the growth, too, is it seems like, at least I know more and more, even some of my friends, photographer friends initially, that were kind of hesitant a little bit about Google+, Plus. like just today, my friend Tom's over on Flickr, Tom Ryboy, who some of you, I'm sure, saw that photo he shot that, from rooftop oh, right. mm-hmm. blows me away. I mean, he's so good, and he gets on all these roofs. And, uh, you know, seeing him uh, come around and get on board, and I think as, as it builds momentum, you'll see more and more of these really talented photographers. Not that they're not already really talented photographers here, but even more jump on board, and I'm excited about that. Yeah, Yeah, me too. Well, I can, I, can I add something? Absolutely, Lily. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I just want to add that, um, you know, when I 
couple of months ago, I got inspired by Google Plus to start shooting flowers. I just, I never shoot flowers before. And with Google Plus and the photographers and the help of the community is the way I've been improving in some way. And then at the same time, I've been trying to help others. So that's, that's I think, one of the best things about the photography community in Google, in Google Plus because everybody is willing to help each other and, mm -hmm. and you push yourself to improve. So, so that's, that's awesome. Yeah. I agree with that, Lily, and I love your flowers too. By the way, mm -hmm. yeah, she has be beautiful macro ph photos. Yeah. Um, what she was saying about encouraging—I've seen a lot of people comment in the photography community about this kind of thing. Um, just recently, I saw a gentleman saying that he finds that the experience here for him is very different than in other places where he's tried to share his photography. People are sharing and encouraging and teaching rather than kind of holding on to, I don't know, like my secrets about my photography <laughs> or I don't want to help you, you know, do what I can do. So he said he's, he really feels like the community on Google Plus is different and just more open and, and, and teaching and learning together. So. Uh, and I think that Trey has been one of the guys who's always said by teaching others, I learned so much myself. That's been my experience as well. I would never be afraid of giving out my secrets because it's like when you say, I read an offer, you also see somebody saw through their pictures, right? Nobody could duplicate your work in the way that you see your life and the details you notice. But by helping others, you learn so much of out of it yourself as well. I, I know I get a lot out of it. Yeah. Great. Well, we do have um, a quick break tonight, but this is kind of an interesting break because uh, in addition to being a sponsor break, uh, tonight's sponsor break also features Trey Radcliffe. Mm -hmm. So we're going to play a short video here, Trey, because we have some questions to ask you about this video. And also, it's for one of our sponsors, Smugma, who I'm okay. familiar with. Okay. Am I getting a royalty off this? Yeah, so we're going to PayPal me some money. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> this is from <laughs> one of our sponsors, but uh, it features Trey, which is why we want to show it tonight. So okay. Let me just see if I can get this to work here. There we go, Clay. Photography for me is very personal. I feel like we're finally at the point where we can capture the world the way we really feel it, the way we really experience it. So that when people see the photo, it takes them at a deep level and makes them almost challenge what they think they know the photo is. Photography is an incredibly powerful way of showing to the world a other person's perspective. There's nothing as fulfilling as photographing real people and capturing the emotion, the love between those two people. So my talk is about capturing moments in time where there's energy and there's excitement and there's passion. But to be able to tell a story that's beyond that single moment is absolutely essential. Photography to me is really all about passion. We're actually going to take the situation and we're going to stop those, those moments. And our goal is to create something so beautiful and so powerful that they're going to be able to go back and relive it time and time again. Photography has progressed so much and so many people experience us in a digital way. And you're hoping that they see in your photo, in your art, what you want them to see. We're known as a high-end boutique studio, and everything along the way has to be professional. So it's a huge decision as to where are you going to put your body at work, and where are people going to experience you online. I put a lot of energy and passion and soul into my work, and it's got to translate. And my website does that. It's one of my great jobs. It's the front door to our studio. For us, Fun Mug is a resource. It's just part of our daily process. It streamlines sales. It hosts our videos and slideshows. When you have a tool, you want it to be something that you don't think about. It's our off-site data backup and archive. The presentation, the images, everything just looks absolutely awesome. I chose Fun because I think it's the best tightest place to represent my artistic self in the world. We've worked with other companies in the past, and we have never seen anything like this. Bottom line is it showcases in a professional way while we do as a student. <laughs> oh, it's my <so> luck! <laughs> and I love this one. 
Just yell at love. Smug on your eyes. We live in a beautiful, vibrant, romantic world. I love to capture it, and I love the idea of millions of people around the world experiencing it. The part that serves it all up and makes it possible is smug love. Okay, that is from Smug Mug, one of our sponsors for t tonight. Trey, uh, you were featured in that video, right? Uh, yes, I was. <laughs> uh, tell us about how you guys made that video. Was that, uh, was that fun to do? It seems very professional. Yeah, there is a, a wonderful gentleman named uh, Anton Lorimer, and he's a videographer. And so I was down in Big Sur one day with my wife. We're at this great... We're at this great uh, resort called the Post Ranch Inn, and I wanted to go shoot uh, Big Sur. And uh, Smug Mug had asked if I wanted to do this. Um, you know, I did it for free. They didn't pay me uh, out of the goodness of my heart. And anyway, so they sent Anton down uh, to Big Sur, and we spent a while uh, at, the, at the ranch there. And then we uh, went out to the surf. Uh, to take some photos, and I didn't really know him, you know, he, he seemed like a nice guy, and he seemed competent and everything, I didn't know what he could do, and so he, he shot video, and this and that, he was a one, one man crew, and I thought, well, you know, what, what could he possibly do, it was one guy, and then you see the final footage, he's a magician, it's very uh, and he's, uh, he is wonderful, I can't, he edits it, he does the story, he does wow. the arc of it, he does the sound, uh, he's just a... Uh, He's a demigod that walks amongst men. <laughs> wow. I think, you know, like that whole cool, sexy hair blowing in the wind thing is what really made me want to check out Smug Mug in the first place. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, that was for the soccer moms, that one. <laughs> I, mean, I think it makes me want to date Trey Reckless myself. <laughs> I don't know if your wife would approve. Well, you know, what she doesn't know on her. Oh, no. Um, anyways, so that was that was our sponsor spot for Smug Mug, and um, now we're going to get into story number two of tonight, which is uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Ivan Makarov. Mm -hmm. Ivan Makarov, he's doing a, a Google Plus photography book. Have you guys heard about this? Oh yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Yep. yep, it's cool. Uh, apparently, we've got uh, over 300 photographers involved now, and they're going to uh, they've got the charity. Uh, United Nations Children Fund that they're donating some proceeds to, and uh, I think this is great. Uh, Avon, I've worked with him on a couple of groups at Flickr, and he did a couple of other books, and uh, I'm excited to see what this looks like. I mean, what do you guys think about books like this? I think it's a great community project. It's good to come together and do something like this. Mm -hmm. I think it's also when the book is done and everybody can get a copy of it, it will be magical to see this book full of photographs of other people in your community on Google+. Plus. I'm very excited about that. I'll definitely be donating some images as well. Yeah, it's a testament of the network itself, of the Google Plus network and the people, everyone just, you know, it was, a, you look at all the, the threads because it's a multi-part uh, thing that Yvonne's been putting out and every time, uh, especially with the first casting call of, of people who were interested, it just he was flooded, and then, the, you know, when the, the charities, which charities should we use, what kind of title, and it's just, uh, it was really, uh, really heartening to see that. Um, and I'm not surprised, not even for a split second. Well, yeah, I was also very enthused that On One Software and Google were going to be uh, paying for the entire publication of the book. I don't know. Totally. Oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> I'm joking about that. No, uh, Self-publishing has come down quite a bit, though, and I'm excited about that. Uh, so looking forward to participating with, with Avon's book with that. And um, uh, another curation project uh, that came out this week is Krista Ray's photography scavenger hunt. Uh, Lotus, uh, you, you and I are going to be judges on this. What do, you, what do you think of that? Yes, and I believe Alan Shapiro as well. So oh, um, I think it's going to be really cool. I think it's another kind of community bonding exercise in a way, you know? T tell uh, everybody, everybody how it works. What? Tell everybody how it works. Uh, well, Chris is going to post, uh, I guess, topics or themes or whatever, and then people have to take their take on that, and they submit all their photos to her. And then she posts them in albums anonymously so that you can't really tell who's, Photo is who. I mean, and then we vote on them. 
and choose a winner. But it's it hugely, is, it is it was hugely popular this this time. I think she said last time they had ninety. She had ninety eight. Mm -hmm. But already she in her post where she called for entries the other day, she capped out at the five hundred comment mm -hmm. level, <laughs> and she had to put another post up. So it's. Looks like it's going to be even bigger this time. People seem it's really capped excited. Out now. It's capped out now. There's no new entries, but it starts on. Oh, yeah, she's closed. No, you can't enter anymore. So it's closed down now. But um, the interest was huge. Mm -hmm. So it looks like it's going to be a big group of people participating. I, I wonder if one of her scavenger hunt items will be to get a photograph of Trey Reckliff. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would do. He's so elusive and running around all the time. <laughs> you can only see me when I dart out from behind a tree and lick an ice cream cone to get back behind it. <laughs> plus, plus, Trey needs a few extra stalkers. Can you imagine that, like, 500 people stalking him for a scavenger hunt? <laughs> exactly. Man, I could probably make some money. I mean, I know where he lives. I could get a bus and charge admission, ride people yeah. over there. Well, sure, sure. <laughs> Lotus, you probably spend many a night hidden out there in the bushes in front of trees. Yeah, I'm actually I'm at the house right now. I'm just in a different room. <laughs> okay, well, I'm looking forward to Krista's project, and I, I also love it to see. Uh, I love it seeing everybody get so excited about these mm -hmm. projects on Google Plus. I think it's fun. It's a great, fun way for the community to engage and, and interact and. Uh, and uh, so I'm excited about that. Uh, I'm also excited about our second sponsor tonight. <laughs> which is Drobo. You good folks at Drobo. Uh, Drobo, uh, for those of you that don't use Drobos, they have a backup storage device that uh, allows you to use multiple internal hard drives for redundancy. Uh, I've got five of them. That's how I store my archives, and we're pleased to have them sponsor the show. And uh, uh, everybody's data is going to fail. It's not a question of... Uh, of if, but when. And so uh, I've always uh, been a big believer in telling people that you should have a backup strategy. And uh, we, I think Drobo is a great one. And uh, we'd encourage you to check them out at uh, drobo.com. So with that, we are going to now get into our very special interview tonight with Trey Ratcliffe. With Trey Ratcliffe. So, uh, we're all going to ask Trey questions, uh, and feel free, guys, just to jump in. Trey, this is about you tonight. We're looking forward to seeing some of your images if you want to share your screen and uh, show us some of that or any little tips or uh, nuggets of wisdom uh, that we'll send our way. Uh, all right. I'll, but I'll, I'll start it off with the first question, and that is um, you describe yourself as a warm-hearted, old-school gentleman explorer with really cool toys. So what's your uh, favorite toy at present? Well, um, it's still my, my Nikon DSLR. I haven't switched over to these uh, mirrorless cameras, although I think I, I will someday. I see myself going there in the next few years. So it's still, it's still the DSLR. That's my, that's my tool of choice. I, you know, I don't uh, obsess on the hardware. You know, for me, it's always been more about the art. And... You know, you always struggle. What do you use for these little taglines of these social services, you know? Because <laughs> it's sort of like a little, a sl small window into your soul. And so I, I do think about that a lot. You know, what do you put up there? I, I recently <laughs> changed mine to uh, life is short. I create pretty things. It reminds me of a Renoir quote, you know, it, um, about making the world beautiful and, and Monet. At, uh, in the end, he had arthritis. It was very hard for him to to paint, and he said, um, you know, the pain is temporary, uh, beauty is forever. And so some of these sentiments I always like, and I, I do try to capture this stuff with my art, and, and uh, so that's kind of why I changed my little tagline to be a little bit more um, art and beauty centric rather than uh, talking about the tools. I actually had two questions that kind of lead off that tagline as well. Uh, I'll fire them both off. Let me know if I should remind you of one of the two. One of them is, uh, if I'd have to sum up some of your images, they're very much adventurous. There's a mysticism about them, right? So, so how do you find that sense in the places that you go to? What's your secret there? Well, um, you know, I, I see the world in a very uh, cinematic way. 
And I love movies. I get really into movies, mm -hmm. in fact. Uh, it's very easy for me to cry in movies, and it's, I'm, I'm really awful. And, and I also see my life uh, sort of as a movie, and I experience everything in a very rich, cinematic um, way. And like people that come in and out of my life, they're almost like actors that have these arcs, and sometimes they return into my life, and, and I collect these stories, and, and I have an overall arc and purpose to my life, and so on and so forth, and uh, plots are always emerging and falling apart. And, and so I like to experience this in a very rich way and capture it in that same manner. And so I'm highly attuned to the world around me, and I'm always um, looking... I think all photographers are, so you guys probably know know what I mean. Uh, let me here, I'll share some things if you guys don't mind, and I can kind of talk through them because you're probably tired of seeing me. Maybe you like to see some some pretty pretty. So let me uh, <laughs> click share, and I can I can answer your question through interpretive dance here. Oh, find it. <laughs> That'll be okay. a first. I love it. Okay. So these are photos that I've never shown anybody. These are all unpublished photos. Maybe one or two I've published. I don't, I don't remember. Uh, but can you guys see that okay? Yeah, it's beautiful. So um, uh, this is from uh, Burning Man. And I guess this kind of speaks to sh uh, Chris's question because, you know, I don't know why I'm drawn to take pictures of things like this. And it's, uh, it's so wonderful and... In some ways, it, it matters what's going on in the photo, and sometimes it, it doesn't really matter. You know, why, why are these white flowers there? Uh, it, it matters, and it doesn't matter. Uh, why are some of these people looking at me? It matters, and it doesn't matter. Why are these two people on the right side? Uh, why, why are they hugging? Um, I love that part of this photo. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, it matters, and it doesn't matter. None of this stuff is posed. I don't pose shots. I just see wonderful little cinematic moments, and I, I capture them because they're, they're interesting. And sometimes I don't really like to talk about the photos because I don't want them to lose the magic. Um, but maybe I'll kind of talk around the, the shape of some of these things. This is, so this is one from Burning Man that I, I quite like. I'll probably publish this one this week. You know, I, I publish a new photo every, every day, um, so I always think about what's coming next, and Here's one. This is sort of a, a typical, I guess, um, shot I like to do, a landscape um, HDR shot. And, you know, I get, I know Thomas gets this and a lot of y'all get this, but I get a lot of hate um, on Google Plus and all over the place for posting shots that I think are, are beautiful and interesting. And it's very interesting to me how other artists who are supposed to be um, creative take so much delight and time in destructive behavior. And I find this to be uh, both intellectually inconsistent from the standpoint of an artist, but also, you know, psychologically interesting why people are so, so negative. But insofar as it, it gets an interesting reaction, I know that this is, uh, this is doing something that, uh, that gets inside people's heads. And I know for sure that people that don't like these kind of photos, and I, I fully admit there's a, a great number of people that don't like HDR photos, it's, it's simply that they see the world differently. And they expect that everyone in the world sees the world the way they do or should see the world the way they do. And I also don't find that to be an intellectually honest thing or way to view the world because I think um, you know, a truly open-minded artist would understand that different people see and interpret visual imagery differently. And for example, there's a lot of people that are into black and white photography. And maybe their brain first recognizes uh, shape and line and this sort of thing. Uh, but to me, uh, I see this kind of stuff and I find, it, um, I find it very interesting and beautiful and I like to capture it like that. Trey, what, um, do, you do, what do you do with the haters? You get a lot of them. I get some of them too. What do you, uh, how do you respond to them? How do you... Oh, I usually, I usually don't respond. I make note of it, and I see if they have any interesting points. I like to think I'm incredibly open-minded, but most of the time I can see that there is um, either they, they just see the world differently than me and they don't recognize that, or they have some sort of strange uh, psychological baggage <laughs> that's causing um, some 
teenage angst, mm. right? <laughs> uh, you know, mature mature artists uh, don't uh, react in uh, a destructive way. And do you so, block? Do you block many people? Do you block? I block them? a few people. Yeah. Um, I don't mind uh, the criticism as long as it's uh, interesting. Uh, but so often the criticism comes off as condescending and belittling, um, which I find uh, off-putting, although I usually won't delete that. So I have one other follow-up question still to the adventure explorer oh, sure. part. Uh, you have all these amazing images of these amazing places, but how do you pick the places to go to? Well, um, so I started out with a list of, of beautiful places that I wanted to visit. Um, you know, I don't I have a little bit of a strange uh, uh, photographic life in that I don't work for clients. I always say no to client work. Uh, so that has left me uh, free to go places that I really want to go. And I started out with a list of beautiful places around the world I want to go to. I haven't hit all those yet. And you would think, you know, like let's say you have a list of 50 places you really want to visit before you die. You would think that as you start checking them off, your list would get thin and you get worried like, oh no, I'm getting to the end of my list. I but it, that doesn't happen. What happens is the more you travel, the more little tendrils you discover that are out there. So now I hear about all these wonderful places around the world that I didn't even know existed last year. And so my list grows and grows and grows, and it's never ending. And now I think there's something uh, almost like a, a Zeno's paradox of locations <laughs> in that as you, you know, that's sort of a math joke, only math people get it. And what happens is that you know, as you get closer and closer to reaching your destination, you end up with an infinite number of places you can visit. Um, so one way I, I find these is using this, you know, we created this new free app called Stuck on Earth. And yes, we have plans to bring it to Android and all these other uh, OS platforms. Uh, so that's been a tremendous resource. I've, I've used that to plan for our upcoming Yosemite trip to find some really cool spots to take photos. Um, and uh, generally, I just accidentally, as I open myself up to the world and other photographers and other travelers, uh, people come into my life that give me really interesting opportunity, ideas, and places to go. And uh, so that's, that's made it easier as well. Have you, have you been in Peru yet, Trey? Uh, no, no, never been to Peru. It's you know, it's high on my list. <laughs> Is that where you are in in Peru? Yeah, I'm from Peru. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It was actually a really fantastic. Uh, just talking about criticism. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw this article by Guy Tal from last week. It's called "The Value and Futility of Critique," and it's just mm -hmm. such a wonderfully pieced together, uh, you know, editorial on. on the the lifespan uh, he almost he graphs out or charts out the you know the longer an artist has been in their vocation and and how criticism what it means to them and and you know uh, from who it's coming to and eventually where it just becomes something that uh, a true artist I think it, it understands that the criticism is something that uh, just uh, it's just in a misalignment with what their vision is for work but I do have a question though for you Trey. Um, yes, and I think uh, I was thinking about this earlier today um, with uh, learning. I think I think it's a it's a knee jerk thing that a lot of us say. You know, we're always learning. We're always learning. I'm 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 always learning as an artist. So so what I'm really interested, uh, you know, to ask you is, is, I know you derive inspiration from art. I know you paint, and I know you you you're well read, and obviously into math uh, and sciences. But in terms of photography, what would you say you're, are you learning? What do you, and if it is, what are you learning from? Who are you learning, you know, um, just to make yourself a better photographer? Well, yeah, I think, uh, I think all of us are always learning, and we learn in different ways. I'm not sure how um, other people generally learn. I've become really comfortable with my own style of learning, and while obviously, Hangouts, and I love communicating with all these other uh, people in Google Plus and other photographers to talk about the the craft of the trade, and I am influenced by that. Um, artistically, um, I'm really uh, uh, I, I'm most of my inspiration comes from some strange uh, fount inside that that snowballs onto itself, and. I, I'll tell you something personal I don't think I've ever told anybody, and I'll, I'll bring it 
you know, full circle around to you, not you necessarily, Brian, but you, anybody that's, that's watching. And I think that inside we all know what is beautiful and interesting. And you can arrive at the shape of what is beautiful and true and interesting over time. And the way I've gone about that is through some strange uh, physical picadellos that I have and that I have developed into and then I get in these feedback loops on and this spirals me off into an interesting place that's unique and different and I've allowed myself to spiral off that into that direction rather than try to bring it back into a, a mainline acceptable uh, stream of art that would be uh, accepted by a committee or if I were to uh, you know, respond to all the criticism out there and my art might end up looking quite normal. So anyway, I've taken these uh, these physical picadillos. I have two of them. One, I think a lot of people may know if they, they follow me. Um, I was born uh, blind in one eye. Um, I can still only see out of my left eye. Just like Thomas, we've actually had a, a very common uh, experience in that we both had patches and we grew up with really weird uh, sensibilities. And um, uh, and this, of course, wires your brain in a certain way because you can only see the world in 2D, uh, which happens to be the the our uh, the way we practice our art. And I think it's probably incredibly effortless for Thomas, like it is for me, to compose a photo because it's just what our brain does, and it's uh, it's just such a natural mechanism for us. So. That has wired me up in a different way. And I've got this other strange um, thing about me um, in that I can't um, touch paper um, or cardboard. Um, I can if I, if I have to. I handle it in a certain way. Uh, but it's always been that way since I've been a little kid. And my, my son has it now. And it's, it's very weird. It makes my brain go crazy and... Uh, so it's very strange walking through a world surrounded by stuff that you can't touch. Um, and, you know, the other night I actually made my, uh, my... My son is 10 and he's really having a, a tough time dealing with this and it r reminds me of how, how hard a time I, I had with it. You know, like he was at a... He was at a, um, uh, an event with other children and they were all on a picnic table and they put out like... Um, uh, gar uh, grocery bags, paper grocery bags, and they were all like using pencils on the color grocery bags. It, it's hard for me to even talk about it. And then the noise was just so much that he, you know, he got under the table and he started to to cry. It, it's very hard to explain this sensation, but I have it too. And then, and so my my wife is having trouble dealing with it with my son, and and uh, I, I it's hard for me to talk about it because I'm close to it. And then. You know, I feel bad because I, I told my wife, said, you know, you're, I don't, I don't know what I meant, but I said, like, you're very insensitive to this. That's not what I meant, and I made her sad, and then I, I felt bad about it, and, and what, what happens is that, you know, this, this, uh, same thing with my eye and, and my inability to, to feel certain sensations, it's wired me up in a certain way that not only am I personally sensitive to everything, but I'm also very sensitive to other people's reactions mm -hmm. to me. And it has led to this sort of second order of empathy. And I bet Thomas has this, because when you talk to people, you're, you're cognizant of what they're thinking about you, right? You, you have a natural human empathy, but you also have this second order of empathy in that you're wondering their reaction to your... Um, you know, your physical uh, picadillos. And it, it kind of puts you at sort of this deep interhuman level in understanding the way that uh, people view and talk and share with one another. Um, now, so bringing this full circle to, to you, I think everybody grows up and has unusual things happen to them. They have unusual trauma in their family. Um, they might have strange physical things about their body, unusual way that they developed uh, their sense of speech or hearing or sight or something. And the whole time, especially as kids, all you want to be is normal and accepted. 
and you don't want to be different from other people. And so your whole life, you've ended up with countless cycles every day thinking, I wish I was like everybody else. I wish I was normal. I hope people don't see that I'm different. Now, for whatever reason, I spawned off on something like, I'm, I'm glad I'm different. Um, not, not this sort of fake uh, proud, like this, this fake pride in being different that you see somehow foisted upon kids that are different. But it really was something like, I think that there's something interesting about this, this defect, so to speak, and maybe I can channel this into a sensitivity that can feed into my art. And only by really exploring that um, have I been able to create something very unique and uh, kind of combining that with this accidental empathy I've gotten for other, other humans. Um, all of that has come together to um, kind of create this, this worldview and this artistic view that I've, that I've um, gotten over time. So I'm sorry for that long answer, uh, but I can't think of a, um, a refrigerator magnet type motto to boil it all down into. Mm -hmm. Three, you know, it's interesting, I, you know, because I felt a lot of the same things in growing up. Uh, like you, I remember in second grade having to wear for what felt like months, but I'm sure it wasn't. You know, this big patch over my eye every day at school, you know, over my right eye. Because they were under the belief back then, and I'm sure you did the same thing, that somehow if they could, they could, you know, block off, I'm sorry, patch over my left eye, if they could block off the good eye, the bad eye would get stronger and could somehow survive. And, and I remember just walking around and bumping into everything because it just it wasn't working. And, of course, as a second grader, you're incredibly self-conscious about all of that. And, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I would play, uh, I'd play baseball, and I was always the worst player, you know, I'd be out in the outfield, and, uh, you know, which was a horrible place for me because I had no sense of depth. And so yeah. the ball would get a hit out there, and I'd say, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it, I'm going to be underneath it to catch it, and it would drop, you know, uh, 15 feet in front of me, and I was nowhere near <laughs> it. Uh, and... The thing yeah. that interests me is that for, for such a big part, the story is the same as if you would ask many Googlers how they arrived at Google, the story is incredibly similar because these are the, the nerds, the outcasts, the people who didn't find a spot before, but they found similar people who could relate to them. And they found a way to take those oddities and turn it into something productive. And that's, that's a pretty cool experience for sure. So that's really awesome to have. Well, certainly, you know, seeing the world in two-dimensional, I mean, a lot of people don't like that, but, you know, I found that I, that that's a wonderful way to see the world as a photographer, because I look at a scene, and it's, it's like, okay, it's, it, I see it as a photograph. I don't see it as the world. I see it, what it looks like as a photograph, and that's, yeah. that's been helpful, so. Yeah. So I, I'm going to have to ask one awkward question, just because I'm listening to the story about paper, and I see books right next to your head. <laughs> yeah, well, this is, um, you know, I love to read. Um, I, uh, I read um, constantly. Of course, now I read mostly on my Kindle or my mm -hmm. iPad. Um, but, you know, I, I, I have to hold books. Um, if, I can, if I can get a book in a position, right, and then I hold it so that I don't have to move my hands on the paper, mm -hmm. uh, then that's, that's the way to go. And I've gotten incredibly adept at using air and wind and stuff to, to turn the pages and just do as little contact as possible. But it's, um, you know, I, I do feel like I'm, uh, you know, uh, trying to handle fissile material sometimes. Uh, yeah, I bet the Kindle is quite a cool machine for you. I, yeah. yeah, yeah, I love it. Hey, Trey, so, so you're, uh, you're moving to New Zealand, right? Right. Tell us a little bit about that. I mean, you've lived in Texas all your life, and now you're making a jump. Uh, What's behind that? Well, there's uh, there's many reasons, um, and you know it's not. Uh, 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 there's many great th reasons to live here in in Austin too. So it's not exactly a 100 percent, zero percent thing. Um, but you know the pros uh, for New Zealand are. I live my life on the internet now, thanks to uh, the blog. You know we have about uh, 10 employees or so, and it's very profitable. So it allows me to kind of live anywhere as long as I have a good internet connection. And it, uh, uh, of the, I haven't traveled everywhere in the world, but of the places I've been, I think New Zealand is one of the most beautiful. I am drawn to the landscapes. Um, I, I think, 
you know, I've kind of plugged into this anthropological part of myself, this Pleistocene entity that likes to see, uh, you know, fresh water and plains and mountains and skies and and uh, you know, I just feel at home when I when I see this kind of stuff. I like to be around mountains, you know, like uh, like Bilbo Baggins. And so when I see <laughs> uh, when I see these vistas, I just feel uh, very comfortable. Um, so that's that's part of it. Uh, I have three kids also, and I kind of look forward to raising them uh, someplace foreign. I'm not anti-U.S. by any means, uh, but there's a little bit of a bubble here in the U.S., you know. And so maybe getting them outside of that bubble from time to time and traveling with them to third world countries and seeing how most people on Earth live, I think would give them a nice... Uh, perspective um, on things, you know, not necessarily that it makes them superior to other children or anything, but it makes, you know, I think the same thing for me, as I see these things, it makes me interesting to myself, um, and I think that's that's a nice, I, I want to give that gift to my kids, the, the joy of, of uh, exploration and self-exploration, both of these things happening at the same time. Uh, New Zealand has great uh, food. I'm not like a uh, one of these, uh, you know, real or organic kind of people or anything. Uh, but everything is quite natural and and uh, and this sort of thing. There, people are nice. It's very laid back. It's a little bit hippie-ish, um, and I, you know, I kind of like that because it's not so uh, it's not so hardcore. Um, you know, pressure, pressure, pressure all the time. Um, so anyway, there's lots of reasons. That was just some of them. So you shot Chernobyl. Yes. Tell us, yeah. about, tell us about that. Do you have any pictures of that? What's um, uh, yeah. I'm be queued up, but uh, I'd love to see some of your pictures and hear about that experience for you. Sure. Let me uh, let me pull those up here while I'm talking about that. So um, I went to Ukraine, Kiev, and I knew Chernobyl was just a little bit north of that. And let me see here, Ukraine. Let me pull up a few of these photos here. Um, okay, let me share screen. Screen share. Doo -doo -doo. Um, so this is the main uh, reactor that melted down. Um, and I just wanted to go because, you know, I like you, Thomas, I, I guess we're both exactly 40 years old and we grew up in the Cold War and we all remember... Uh, the uh, the big meltdown and how secretive everything was so I I was so excited to go check all this stuff out and so this was an interesting area but really the the most interesting area was not Chernobyl the reactors but was this nearby town called uh, Pripyat and Pripyat um, was in the fallout area and it was a fully functioning Soviet town master planned there were kids in school there were playgrounds there was this Ferris wheel and everything was immediately evacuated. And now when you go, um, you know, you can see uh, the schoolhouses, you can see the homes, you can see how everything was abandoned. There's still uh, books on the school desks. Um, there's still, um, you know, uh, unmade beds. Um, it's just really, really creepy. So we walked around and we had a, uh, there's me with a Geiger counter. Uh, this is, uh, we had, I had a Soviet military guy with me. And uh, he had a Geiger counter, and every now and then he would start to panic and say, we should really leave this area because there's a lot of cesium-138 <laughs> in the area. Has your um, hair thinned since you've been back? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was, uh, my mom wasn't too happy with me going on that trip, but man, it, was, uh, it was really, you know, plus, really cool. Plus, plus you're the only 11-finger photographer I know. <laughs> right. So... Right. Trey, was it was it easy to get to go there, or did it require some authorization? Or, um, well, it it required a bit of authorization. I had to um, uh, go a special route and talk to. Uh, there was a lot of checkpoints I had to go through, um, and uh, I don't know if I was actually. I still don't know to this day whether I was actually uh, paying the right resources or whether I was bribing people. Uh, but I got in. Um, I was funny. I went with my friend uh, Will Kelly, uh, and he forgot his passport. I don't know why. I mean, you can't get into a one of these military. It's still military, right? And he didn't have his passport. And they put him in a bunker 
and he had to watch uh, Ukrainian uh, dubbed Columbo for like 10 hours while I was touring uh, Chernobyl, so he didn't get to see anything. Um, but yeah, I think now it's easier to get into Chernobyl. I think almost anybody can go. You've got to plan ahead. Uh, but yeah, it was uh, quite an experience. Yeah, and is, is the radiation there? Is, I mean, is it that big of a threat? I mean, you have the Geiger counters. Is it... Uh it's not, it's not so bad. Uh, you know, there's a few areas that haven't been scrubbed clean quite yet, and so you'll hear the Geiger counter click like crazy sometimes, you know, like in an episode of uh, 24 with Jack Bauer, and you just get that nervous feeling like, i gotta, I got to get out of here. But other areas are perfectly safe. Um, there's still some people that live inside the exclusion zone, strangely. You, st you st occasionally see very eerie, ghostly people walking around. It's kind of creepy. Uh, but for the most part, most it's just parts. deserted. Hmm. Has there been any place that you went to that, um, I, whether you had expectations or not, but you get there and they, and they simply did exceed your expectations? Like you go there and like, wow, this is beyond words. Yeah, probably. Uh, let me. I'll share this this place because I know this is some place that uh, Thomas wants to go, and this is a, a wholly unique place in the world. Um, let me share my screen. And it's some place that I go uh, now every year, and I just know it's going to be awesome, but I just don't know what I'm going to see. Uh, this is uh, Burning Man, of course. And it's the only place in the world you can go to, and you know you're going to see awesome stuff, but you just don't know what it's going to be. Like if you go to Agra, India, you know you're going to see the Taj Mahal, and you know it's going to be awesome. Or if you, you know, go to Paris, you know you're going to see the Eiffel Tower or whatever. But here, you know, I didn't know this was going to be here. But you get here, and it's awesome, and then you get to set up and, and take a shot. Um, so I would say I would say Burning Man. Are you, are you going to Burning Man this next year, Trey? I think so. Yeah, yeah I think I'll be going. And you've gone twice? Yeah, I've been yeah. twice now. Yeah. Any, any advice for uh, first-timers like myself? That's a good question. Um, let me switch to my Burning Man thing. I'll show these while we're... Um, well, for advice, you know, it's real sandy there, right? Because it's not like normal sand, like beach sand, like you might be used to. It's a very fine sort of alkaline sand. Um, and it blows around something fierce. And there's always like some sort of cloud of sand there just waiting to get into your lens and into your camera. So definitely do not change lenses um, when you're outside. Um, I'd even resist it inside because there's always stuff flying around and you don't want to get that stuff inside your lens. So what I usually do is I just take a, a, a micro four-thirds and use that as my main camera. I used an Olympus pen camera uh, for a lot of these. Wow. And um, what happens is, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, if you're a photographer, you really don't care what kind of camera you have. And these micro four-thirds are so good, it's a great excuse to start that. using some of these cameras. So yeah, these are really amazing. These are amazing photographs. And these are uh, on tripods, I assume. Especially Some the are on tripods, uh, like this one is, is on a tripod. And I do bring out my big gun on occasion, uh, like when I'm sure that there's not much uh, uh, sand out and about, um, and I'll set it up on, on a tripod. Um, but you can find so much amazing stuff there. Did, did, you, did you run an RV and stay in an RV, or what, what did you do for, did you camp it out, or what did you do? I did. Um, I got an RV, and I stayed um, I stayed in the RV. Actually, Tom Anderson came and uh, stayed with me. That's not Tom. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good way to go, because you can kind of change your lenses, and, uh, and it's a little bit safer environment for that sort of thing. How much sleep did you get? <laughs> well, uh, so I'm not a fan of, of the heat, uh, really, uh, and I'm maybe a little wimpy like that. Uh, so <laughs> what I do <laughs> is I, you know, well, I, I don't, I'm not a fan of the heat down here either. Uh, but what I, what I do is I, uh, is, this is, I might lose some Burning Man cred here, but maybe I'll get it yeah, back yeah. in the end. Because what I do is during the day, I sleep, and I like crank on the air conditioning, you know, and I... I'm in my RV and I bring uh, gourmet cheeses and I eat <laughs> nice fruit and I, I, I eat well. You know, I have some chocolates and I, I process photos and 
I nap like a cat during the day when it's hotter than East Jesus outside. And then at night, at sunset, right, that's when all the lights come on. That's when everyone goes out. That's when it gets really interesting. So that's when I go out. It's nice and cool. You can wear like a sweatshirt or a coat and get all cozy and go out and explore and take photos. So night is really the best time to be out. So I sleep during the day and I go out at night and that's sort of my um, routine. Come on. That's smart. Trey, what about, what about software? Do you have some, I mean, obviously uh, technology does great things for photography these days. Uh, what software programs do you use and do you have favorites and what about all that? Yeah. Uh, first, let me say something very meta about uh, processing. Uh, and this is sort of an ideological uh, thing. I'm sure Brian from On One Software will appreciate this. And that is, you know, I get a lot of pushback uh, for post-processing, right? I am known for HDR or whatever, but generally I post-process with many, many different tools. Um, I think people like to quickly categorize you into one subgenre, and that's fine. But I do like all these various tools, and somehow it's seen as unholy, or I am less than a photographer because I... I post process, uh, but uh, really, what it is is about getting the light uh, interesting, right? Getting the light the way I want it, uh, and making it uh, an interesting cinematic type piece. And uh, you know, photographers uh, generally uh, who want to get this kind of effect but don't want to post process will spend a very long time setting up lights and uh, doing all kinds of crazy things with uh, strobes or, or uh, reflectors or whatever. Uh, in fact, they might often have a big crew to help them do all this stuff. And uh, you know, to them, uh, manipulating the light before a photo is perfectly okay, but it's not okay after you take the photo. <laughs> to me, this is an arbitrary uh, point at which to uh, manipulate the light. Um, who cares if you manipulate the light before or after the photo? You're still manipulating the light. So don't let these photographers um, cow you or make you feel bad for manipulating the light after you take the photo. Um, you know, this is uh, maybe just my own personal justification, but I think it makes a lot of logical, rational sense. So having said all that, I do use a lot of post-processing tools. I use, um, I use Brian's On One software. I use Nick software. I use uh, HDR uh, software from Photomatics. Um, I have reviews of all this stuff on my website and sample screenshots of how you can use various tools to do different things. Um, yeah, I love all these tools. They're just uh, they're just fun. Um, yeah. Do you uh, do you do you find new software coming out? Are you constantly looking for new stuff to use or? Yeah, I do. Um, I try new stuff all the time. Uh, there's so many tools out coming out nowadays. It's uh, hard to keep up with them all. And in fact, a lot of these tools come out, and they've got so many options and sub-options. I, I hardly know where to start. Um, in fact, I think I was, you know, uh, uh, Brian knows I don't hold back my opinions, and and I got the new on one <laughs> software, right? And uh, it's got so many dang options, and, and it's confusing because it calls like one photo tools 2.6, and they've got something else that's 4.3. And I mean, I don't know. It's it's like this was written by uh, you know the government. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, but there's some real there's some hidden gems in there if you can just find the right sub menus and work your way around. Um, so that usually takes a long time for me to go through and find some of the best of the best. But it's not just that way with On One. It's that way with a lot of these various tools now. Um, uh, but yeah, I do try new ones all the time. And you yeah, feel I like that time is well spent, though, because you have a new tool to use. Or not. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I love, I love having these new tools. I feel like, you know, I'm not into uh, cooking, uh, but I, <laughs> I'm cooking curious. And I watch some of these cooking shows, and I see Alton Brown, you know, he, he goes to uh, the store and he's got like uh, 17 different paring knives out there. I think, oh my gosh, you know, that's so awesome. I think I, I want that paring knife too. And so I get into the tools because uh, I think they're cool. <laughs> now, when, when you shoot, uh, you know, you have something already in mind 
for the, the result or it, it comes, you know, with the process and you get inspired in something and then you get something totally different or how, how does it work for you? Um, well, you know, I, I think what happens is, um, uh, here, I'll, I'll show a photo here. I started showing it before, but this is a, a good opportunity to talk about it. Let me click a screen share and go back to my iPhoto. Um, so, you know, so I'm walking along in Japan, in Tokyo, and I, I see this, uh, I see this, right? And, um, you know, I didn't plan to take the shot. All this stuff is candid. And I think a lot of us now do t walk around with our cameras. I know Thomas does all the time. And when you're a photographer, you, you see things I think that normal people don't see, right? I actually wonder if non-photographers would even notice this. And it makes me happy that I'm a photographer and I do notice this stuff. And so I take the photo and I kind of lock everything into my memory and so that I can process it correctly later on. Um, sometimes I am a place uh, to, to set up a shot um, like this one. This is in New Zealand. And I think, uh, uh, you know, it's this, this amazing uh, cinematic type experience. Um, but then I have to work a little bit to get the kind of shot I want. So, you know, I, people might notice that this uses something called compression, which is done when you use a zoom lens and you zoom in quite far onto a scene. And it takes objects in the distance and makes them a little bit more grandiose. So this is one of these wonderful long roads that just kind of goes off into forever. And if I had taken this at a, a wide angle shot, it would have made those uh, distant mountains seem a little bit more meek, or maybe not quite so interesting. And so I, uh, if you zoom way in, it can make everything look a little bit more grand. I'll, I'll, show, you one, uh, I'll show you two more examples here. Uh, now this is one that really required me to uh, have some forethought and post-processing execution on it. Uh, this is in the south of China. And it's this wonderful, wild, ancient um, place. And I knew when I took the photo that it would come out a little bit flat and empty. And it wouldn't really communicate the, the feeling of being there, uh, which is too bad. You know, this does happen from time to time, where you're just in a really magical place, but you know the photo is going to come out flat and uninteresting. So artistically, I grabbed a few photos of some textures in the area and I decided to combine them later with this, um, with this sort of effect that I've been working on over the past few past years. And so that kind of helped me um, to help uh, realize the final scene. Um, here's the last one uh, that's still unpublished. Uh, this is a, a, a blind couple that was walking down this old road in this um, old town in China. And I, I knew that this was very interesting, watching them, this one guy with a stringed instrument and another woman holding out a, a, a bowl for donations. And I wanted to capture it, uh, but I wanted to capture it the right way. And I don't know if you can tell or not, but they will walk down this sort of alleyway, this tiny, tight road, and there's pools of light uh, that are strewn out by these uh, storefronts. And so I went uh, quite a ways down the road, and I got down on my knee and waited for them to come into this one pool of light. And I, I took it because I, you know, I wanted to get them in this way. So this one was not, uh, this one was more planned than most, and I, I felt like this was probably the only way I could capture it, uh, the way I really felt it. So this one took uh, quite a bit of planning in the. Uh, in the execution of the shot. Isn't that storefront light the best, though, Trey? I, sh I shot some of the stores like that down in South Beach in Miami, and I just sit there on the on the on the sidewalk and just wait for people to walk into it. It's so nice. Yeah, it is nice, and it gives me. You know, I don't do a lot of street photography. When I go out and do it, I love it. Um, but you know, there's other great street photographers out here. Um, you know, like you and Eric Kim and. Uh, so many people, and I, I really uh, take great pleasure in seeing good street photography because it, I feel like my success rate on street photos is a lot lower than uh, maybe my landscape photos, and I like to get better because I really uh, I admire that kind of photography quite a bit. Oh, you've got some great stuff. Well, hey, one thing we are going to um, 
do, because we're going to have to end the recorded portion of the show here very shortly, because we're running over an hour now. And um, uh, we are going to actually end this Hangout, but come right back. So there will be a second Hangout for everybody that's watching. And everybody in the chat room, stay here, because we're going to start a second Hangout. This is a little glitch here with the new Google On Air Hangouts. They can only be so long. Uh, in order to edit them. So uh, we're going to start a new hangout, but before we do that, we did have something to give away tonight. Right, Brian? That's right. And what is what is that that we're giving away tonight? Oh, giving away a copy of Perfect Photo Suite 6. Perfect Photo Suite 6. And I have to say, I've just started using this myself, Brian, and I love it. I think it's amazing all of the things you can do, you know, playing around with the various textures and frames and all of that. So, so I'm a fan. It's take. It's going to take me some while, like Trey, to figure out all the little idiosyncrasies that make it all that it can be. <laughs> It'll be worth your effort. Maybe Trey can give us a training session. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. So I thought how we would give it away tonight, if you guys are okay with this, is um, we gave away the other night. We did our giveaway uh, based on the chat room. So people who were watching the show in the chat room. So this is for all of you that are uh, watching the show, and um, I figured I'd put a question out there for you, and whoever got the answer first would win the software. Are you guys good with that? Yeah. Sure. Okay, so this is, a, this is a question about Trey. So one thing I noticed when we had our Stanford photo walk with Trey is that uh, Trey brought some wonderful fudge from his mother. Which I particularly enjoy, and I think I got about eight shots of me uh, shoving my face with that, <laughs> so, uh, which was great. And, and Trey, I understand your mother is quite uh, adept at the cooking for your photo walks. Yeah, she. Yeah, that's that's uh, kind of become her unofficial role. Okay, so the question is, uh, who can be the first person to post a link to Trey's mother's Google Plus? Stream. <laughs> in the chat room. All right. She's very active on she's uh, very Google+. Active. She's, oh, yeah. she's on my stream all the yeah, time. I love uh, her. Yeah. <laughs> so let's see who can post the link to uh, Trey's. Oh, I think we have it. Got one. This, uh, Deanna is the first person. Yep. Let me check if it is actually she Trey's did mother. She did. It's Susan Ratcliffe. There it yep. is. Look at that. So, yep. Okay. We have a winner. Okay, a lot of people posted it afterwards. I hope your mother gets a lot of new followers over this. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the verified Susan Radcliffe? So, yeah, uh, yeah well, she needs to be verified. So, <laughs> Deanna, Deanna, if you would uh, get in touch with Brian, who's on Google+, Plus, he's pretty easy to find, right, Brian? Uh, and I'm sure he can arrange to get you that uh, software. Does that sound good Absolutely. Yes? That's perfect. Yeah, just uh, send me a message through, you know, the Google interface, and uh, I'll be happy to get your license uh, electronically. All right. Excellent. Okay. And with that, we are going to end this broadcast, but don't go away because we're going to come right back. We're going to invite everybody back, and we're going to take questions from the chat room and from Google Plus and from other places uh, with Trey. So thanks for the show, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next episode, and we'll be right back. Bye. Bye. Bye.